fans, and welcome back to the short round, the official podcast of Proteo Canada. I am your host, Wacey Anderson, and I am excited to be joined by a special guest host and my friend, Canadian champion bull rider, the 20 and 2023 Cowboy of the Year, Tanner Gerlitz. Tanner, thanks for joining me this week. It's going to be a fun show. Yeah, no, it's good. It's uh, something I look forward to. And now that I'm behind a desk and at a computer, if I can still talk about rodeo during my day job, it works out good. So before we get into kind of the the meat of everything here, I want to go back to 2023 CFR. Um, as I mentioned, you won Cowboy of the Year. I want to talk a bit about that. Like it's a huge honor. Um, puts yourself in a pretty prestigious class of people. Um, yes, yeah, so let's talk a bit about the award and how it felt to to be awarded with that at the end at the end of the CFR. Um, it's still fairly surreal. Um, I actually nominated someone else for Cowboy of the Year this year, and <laughs> they didn't do it at the awards banquet, and I was confused because. Chad Bestbug, who's a great friend of mine, he come up to the awards banquet. So I assumed that the guy that I nominated was getting the award because a whole bunch of people from the Calgary Stampede showed up yep. to the awards banquet. But then they all said that they're there for Explosive Skies winning Horse of the Year, and which was fair. And I was like, okay, sounds good. And then it didn't happen, didn't happen. And then they didn't do it. And then the first perf, they had a buck a re-ride in the steer ride right before the intermission. And I uh, I told Kyle Danes, I said, I'm going to go to the far end. You go ahead and you got this. He's like, no, just wait. There's a screw up. And I said, what do you mean there's a screw up? And he started looking at his sheet on the run of show and he's telling me a bunch of BS about how there's <laughs> this was wrong and this was wrong. And then Billy Richards come over and he started trying to fill me. And then I was like, you guys, this is like kindergarten stuff. You got this. I'm going to go to the far end and get started on the team rope. And like, let's go like, get your heads out of your butts and then they uh billy goes don't have to be mad just turn around and accept your award and i was like what i look behind me and that's when i seen my wife and kids and denny and terry and the whole crew from legends come out with that bronze and um it was to be recognized about i feel i work pretty hard at rodeo but i didn't ever just think i deserve this or i don't expect a pat on the back for the work i do i just I know how much work went into the career I had and the people that were behind me and I'm just trying to move it forward. I had a ton of people behind me and it, uh, without them, like there's probably 40 people in my, uh, phone log that could win Cowboy here tomorrow for the help they gave me throughout my career. So it's, it's pretty surreal to be picked by your peers and nominated by a couple of good friends of mine. I, I finally got to the bottom of who nominated me and it, uh, it was, pretty surreal to get it to hear your name called and get that award in that arena it's funny when you mentioned like the kind of the moments before they handed you the award. i remember being in the arena at that time and it was it just seemed like like every like kyle and billy had everybody so confused and turned backwards that it was it was kind of like the perfect like mixed misdirection to have to kind of get everybody out there to give you the award yeah it was I was like, you guys, I well, and because it was like a busy time, right? Like that's a like yeah. we're, we're trying to rattle off a quick show, and it's like that's the last thing on your mind. So when something like that comes up, you're just like, hey, well, you guys handle it. I'm gonna go do my job. And the first perf of the CFR this year, all the arena crew, Keenan Vine included, we had no comms. The comms didn't work. <laughs> no. something happened with the comms. We had no way to talk to each other. So, and I thought the comms were off after I got the award, I thought they'd come back on. I thought Keenan had him shut off because he knew I was getting the award. He was trying to stay in Kyle's ear. But no, we didn't have comms the whole first perf. So that whole first perf was fairly old school with hand signals. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Man. So it was it was a tricky one to, to get me Keenan and Kyle and Billy and everyone that was behind it. They did a really good job of of keeping it kind of under wraps for the That's situation. So awesome. So where 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 does this rank in your kind of the accolades of your career? Like yeah, you, you had a very successful career as a bull rider. Um, you've done a, a ton of work behind the scenes that you joined the CPRA on the rodeo administrator front. Um, yeah, where does where does this kind of rank with everything that you've done in your career? I mean, it's got to be at the top. I've ate, slept, breathed rodeo my whole entire life, and to get recognized with an award like that is is huge for me, and not only me and my whole family. You know my my wife is 100% behind me all the time. My kids, they both love it. Stratton, he wears out every single little bull he's ever had. And um, Rowan's horse crazy. She's got three horses of her own already, and she's riding them around. And um, It means everything to me. And just to, sh to get the support from people that 
that I love and that people that, you know, I respect in the rodeo world is, is huge. Um, the bull riding title in 06 is, is big for sure, but that was something that I had to do myself. This is something that other people thought of me. So it was, it's a pretty prestigious award. Well, actually, I kind of want to save some of your the old rodeo stories and stuff for as I bring you on the show more and more, I think it'd be fun to go back kind of into the past. But right now I want to talk a bit more about your role with the CPRA. Like I said before, you're the rodeo administrator. What's, what's things looking like day to day for you? How have you enjoyed that transition from um, competing in the arena to being involved with the backside of, of the rodeo world? Um, It's, it was a challenge at the start. Um, I've always said I've got big shoulders and I can take some stuff. Um, My first year was, it was a lot. There was a couple deals. There's some ground issues at a few rodeos and just judges and fines and, you know, the stuff that I'd never really thought of until I took the job and your phone rings a lot. Um, through the winter months, it's kind of just trying to get set up and ready for the next season. Uh, right now it's busy. I got four more approvals just hit my desk here today. So trying to get them all typed up and ready to go to the PRCA and WPRA and everywhere else and get posted on the website so it's it's kind of surreal you know it's i took for granted when i was rodeoing mm. the work that goes behind getting a rodeo going and since i quit rodeoing i got into as you know like the kind of the production side of things with the yeah. shoe bossing and arena directing and i tried to help out as much as i can at as many rodeos as i go to and step in where i can but there's a lot of moving parts and even from months out of the rodeo start time it's uh it's a quite a process that a guy kind of takes for granted when you're rodeoing to see it firsthand now is kind of it's i i enjoy the hell of it it's it's That's uh cool. yeah yeah it's you get to see kind of all the the back burner and the you find out you find out who your friends are right away i know that <laughs> oh, it's good though <laughs> like i said i got big shoulders and people can chew on me and i can wash it off it doesn't really bother me well it's it's funny you mentioned like the transition from competing to being part of the production side of things like as a competitor you're showing up to a lot of these rodeos and you're just paying your fees getting on to go on to the next one you don't really realize how much time and effort and getting the right people in place and all the volunteers involved with putting on a huge rodeo like that's but for, for maybe from your aspect it's maybe a smaller rodeo but like a place like armstrong that they're planning for a year yeah, like, to the next year like there's so much put into it but as a competitor you don't really get to see that because you're you're really just showing up to to compete and then on to the next one so it's it's, it's neat that you mentioned that how that the difference between the competitor side and the production side of rodeo and how a person comes to appreciate it once you kind of see how it all works for sure and um you know there's lots of contestants that do appreciate it. there's a handful that mm -hmm. don't appreciate it and it's i think every contestant in rodeo should volunteer for a rodeo committee for at least once in their life to see mm -hmm. what actually goes into putting on a rodeo i think that is huge or a board of directors or something you know um i sat on the board as a board riding director for a few years as well and then i took a couple years off and just kind of did my own thing and now i'm back as road administrator but until you volunteer your time to put into what it takes to put on a rodeo i don't think you can really have an appreciation of what it actually goes into it you think that um you're jumping into the production side but kind of right after your your bull riding career has helped you're the this new position with the rodeo administrator like how like how big of a uh, factor has that been like even with wanting to take the position like i'm sure that was kind of a big decision too yeah it was and you know what with the production side of things i got a lot of different connections than i had and i when i was just mm -hmm. strictly a bull rider like i got to go around and meet lots of committee people meet like go i knew like guys like chris cook and sean metris and the screen guys before just to say hi but now to get to work with them here and there and actually get to see some of the pyro guys and all that stuff you get to you get a new respect for all the other moving parts and mm. the connections you make with it um if the cpra can lend a hand with like a rodeo committee needing some help with production i can i now have these connections i can forward them on to rodeo committees it's cool to see like the amount of talented people we have in canada even you mentioned the production side of things like i would stack up a lot of the production folks that we have in canada up against any crew in the world like you look at this past cfr i talked a bit about it with brett gardner when i had him on and it's like they those openings this year were like some of the best i've ever seen like i would put those up against any nfr opening that they're after watching the last year's show in vegas there 100 percent. you know um 
my favorite one was the one where Tyler Kraft come out on his horse yeah. of the year baby and was cracking his whip and then Zeke and all them guys come out on other horses and they pushed them bucking horses around and left. That was that was pretty cool to go back to actually what the Cowboys mm -hmm. doing and every guy that they had on a horse that night was an actual cowboy that was there and they've done it and it was uh it's pretty cool. Um me and Tyler are really good friends. We went to college together, lived together, grew up together. And just a while, I went down to the NFR this year. I had meetings and stuff for the CPRA, and I did some business there. But the first perf for the NFR, I had to make sure I was at that one to go watch him ride in the arena for the first time. It was pretty cool to watch. Me and Tyler actually picked – I, me and him picked up our first Bronx together at Odessa, Texas. Wow. The college there. We they had a couple horses at the college, and me and him got picked. I got picked because my dad was a pickup man, and he got – pick because he was my buddy and we got on these two old horses and <laughs> we went and picked up and I, it was pretty cool to see how far he's come in the last 15 20 years were you were you nervous for him at that first perf i know it was I, when i talked to him he mentioned how nervous he was and it's funny to hear a guy like that who's just like the kind of you when you picture someone who's calm cool and collected you picture tyler just so like he kind of shows no emotion which is neat but were you nervous for him as well uh going into that first perf in vegas i wasn't nervous for him just because i know how like that guy has ice water running through his veins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, his horsepower is second to none. Mm -hmm. um, he's got some of the nicest horses I've ever seen. And I knew if Tyler was nervous, his horses were going to make him not nervous. Just they roll in there and do their job like they're supposed to. Do. And once that first bareback horse comes straight to him and he got the flank, got the guy off in two seconds and down he set him and rode back, I knew he was off to the races right after that. It's kind of like kind of like the top top end competitor side of things too. It's like kind of you, ha you have the nerves, which is a good thing. But then once that shoot gate cracks or once the perp starts, it probably just like that switch clicks and you're like dialed in, ready to go. Which I'm sure you know of from competing at a high level in your career too. Yeah, for sure. It's it's something you got to have a, a switch on, like the Houston's, San Antonio's, short rounds, mm -hmm. places like that. I mean, you get there and you're like, man, I'm. A little short guy from Canada <laughs> along here and then you just got to flick the switch and you, you know, you belong and you got to get your nerves pushed aside and turn your nerves into excitement and just go do what you do. Uh, so before we jumped on here, you were mentioning how there's some exciting stuff coming up for the 2024 season. I just want to kind of get into that and what are some stuff we can look forward to from CPRA? What's the schedule looking like? How's 2024 shaping up from your perspective? Um, last year, I jumped on this job and position in March, and lots of the approvals were in already. And this year, I've had probably five or six new events wanting to come on. Um, I haven't got anything signed or nothing yet, but there's a lot of interest in new events in Rodeo in Canada. I think there's going to be, I think three of them for sure will go. Mm. And I'm looking forward to They're, they're going to be all great rodeos. And there's some big news coming from a, a bronc rider in Canada coming up here that I think is going to be big. And it's, it's pretty cool to see the growth in Canada and it wouldn't surprise me at all if every event takes to at least 20,000 to make Canadian finals next year. And that's, that's one of the things that I've talked about with a few folks is I, I feel like we kind of, the consensus is that they feel like rodeo is like officially back in 2024 in Canada. We, We've got like places like Pinocchio adding up their prize money to 60,000 and more competitors. And I, I feel like from through my lens and what I've seen, the competition is like as best it's ever been in the country, I think across the board. So I think that saying of like 2024 is the, the year of, of rodeos back in Canada. I think it's safe to say that that's going to be the case with like hearing what you, what you have to say and whether others have to say about kind of the state of rodeo in Canada. Yeah, for sure. I think it's it's going to be awesome. I, like our bronc riders in Canada right now are second to none. Mm -hmm. Our bulldoggers in Canada are second to none. Really, all of our events are are really, really strong right now. And with the amount of money that Pinocchio is adding, and I think we'll see a lot of U.S. competitors coming up this summer and staying for a few weeks and trying to get the rodeo counts in. Um, I have the advantage. I also am the coach at the Olds College. Mm. And so I get to see a bunch of young guys coming up, and there's more coming down the pipe. Um, they bucked some horses the other day out by Cochrane and there's four bear rec riders there that were all 16 years old and they were all good enough to go like they all wow. made 80 point rides and they're uh it was pretty refreshing to see they got I haven't heard of a practice pen in Canada getting nine bareback horses bucked in a session no. before they uh they did her that night and them kids got on and they all rode really well and 
there's some young kids coming up on the high school finals. The last couple of years I've went to seen some kids coming up there. Um, it's all coming down the pipe. And I think rodeo is just growing and growing and growing. And the level of the contestants now with the new, it's not just high school rodeo anymore. They have the junior high school finals and the mm -hmm. high school finals. And there's such a stepping stone for the kids coming up. It's, it's great. And the sky's the limit for these kids. If they want to put the work in, there's no telling where they might end up. It's cool. You mentioned kind of the stepping stones. Cause you look at kids like even, even Bo Gardner is a good example of that he's kind of walked the path to kind of get to his highest level of success. And, and you know, I think you'll see more and more kids doing that um, as they progress through. Because I think, I think, I think one thing is like maybe like parents have a better idea and there's guys like you giving back who kind of can help pave that way for them. And then obviously I think rodeo is kind of flipped to where it's like these, these kids and these people and the people competing are turning into like legit athletes, like it's a professional sport and they're taking care of their bodies. They're doing the extra work outside the arena. They're putting in the practice. And I think that's such a huge factor, which hasn't been the case for a long time with rodeo. Yeah. And I mean, like when I was a kid, we rode steers and we rode bulls. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're lucky if you went junior bull riding once in a while, but for the most part, you rode steers and bulls. And then when you're a steer rider, you just got thrown in with bull riders and your parents, you just, that's what you did. You, your parents sent you with bull riders and you learned the ropes that way, kind of a rough way to go. But <laughs> I think I learned a lot from it as well. Like sure. by the time I was 16, I was ready to enter and go and by myself um, nowadays, the kids, have, I think, have an advantage where their parents are taking them most of the time. And, you know, six out of 10 of the kids have their own practice stock at home now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> where we used to have to go, like I'd go to Olds on Tuesday nights, uh, Statler Friday nights, Vermillion Wednesday nights, and Brooks Thursday nights to practice. I'd drive all over Alberta mm -hmm. doing on practice bowls. And, and now most of the people have their own practice stock. Like last night, Jason Wheeler brought two bareback horses for his kid to come get on. And they were perfect little hopping horses and kid got two road and he's been on like 10 head. And like, it looks like another guy that was a former CPRA contestant, CFR qualifier is going to have a kid that's going to do the same thing. So, and I mean, everyone and their dog is raising bucking horses and cow or bulls now. <laughs> yeah, It seems like that industry is growing so much with the fraturity system and everything mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of opportunity for people to parents especially to have young kids ex coming up um lots of the guys don't like to hang on to them 75 78 pointers and if they want to move them to someone that has practice stock there's a lot of opportunity for people to buy practice stock that is appropriate or even old horses or bulls that just yeah. kind of have slowed down i think that's a big learning curve um, when I was a kid, I got on a lot of calves just because at girl rodeo stock, I was the dummy before dummies were <laughs> around. So dad always set it up. There's always like three or four old ones at the back that I wanted to get on. I had to get on the three or four calves first. And then once I got through the calves, I got my pick of the old ones. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I always finished on a really strong note. And I think that's huge in trying to build kids and and build talent is rewarding them for what they do. Um mm -hmm. I think practice is huge. I, don't, I think draw barrels and stuff are good, but there's no such thing as the real thing. And a guy's got to get on if he wants to get better. Um, yeah. You see lots of kids having the opportunities now to get on what they want, when they want. And I think it's great. Yeah. And I think it just instills that confidence in him. That's that's one thing that, that Bill Gardner talked about a lot is he's, he's had that confidence like the whole way through. And I think that's such a huge thing. It's easy maybe if you're not getting on the right stuff or maybe in the wrong situation to kind of have that confidence, maybe not where it should be at that specific level. But I think now it's kind of dialed into where you're getting these kids with the right, the right confidence heading out to the right stage of their careers. Yeah. You know what? Um, Bo's dad, Nate should have a seminar on how to raise young Cowboys. Yeah. Because that guy has, he's had a handful of kids come through there, not just Bo. He's got other kids that kind of travel around with the help of other parents as well, mm -hmm. like the leech kid. And there's a few of them kids that are, kicking around Nate's place that they're all going to be really handy kids. And um, Nate's kind of put them all through the same little program. And these are your bulls and these are the ones you get on. And it wasn't until last year I seen Bo at the old college just getting on whatever on end, you know, like Bo always had a, a set practice pen and he'd bring his own bulls if he come to olds and he'd get on them, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But last year he kind of branched out and started getting on whatever they're on under him. And I mean, Bo's ready now. He, yeah. He called me before one and he said, Do I think I should stay on my permit and try to make the win the permit award? I'm like, You're get your card. You're gonna, you're gonna yeah. make it, man. You're gonna make the CFR. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's no doubt there. But 
Uh, it's definitely an exciting time for rodeo in Canada, and we look forward to an exciting season in 2024. Um, I think right now is a good time to throw out our interview with Bo Cooper. Um, we'll be back shortly with this interview, uh, shortly after this interview with uh, professional talent rope Bo Cooper. So enjoy. <laughs> Welcome back to the short round. This week, we have one of the brightest up and coming stars in the tie down roping, and he is also a CFR and Wrangler National Finals Rodeo Qualifier. Welcome to the show, Bo Cooper. Thanks for joining me, man. What's going on? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, not much hiding out, of the, hiding out of the rain, so it's a good time to do it. Well, and you're, you're hiding up in Texas right now, so you just wrapped your setup in Fort Worth, qualifying for the wild card round. Talk a bit about that and, and kind of what's next down the road for you. Yep. So uh, I guess I come back to the wild card around the 31st of January. Yeah, it was good. I felt like I made uh, two decent runs. Uh, uh, second one, I felt like I should have been a little faster. But, you know, it's no big deal. <laughs> exactly. yeah. We got some money out of there. I think all three of us ended up tying. We all had 2,500. So, so was... how does the tiebreaker work there? Well, so it goes on fast time, and so I kind of got the end of the stick, and I was the odd guy out, so I got to go to the wild card, and they got to go to the semifinals. But and then it's like top two or whatever coming out of the wild card make it to the into the semifinals. Is that how they kind of similar to yeah. old school Calgary? Yeah. Okay, yeah, cool, nice. And then, yeah, one one each, uh, one goes to each semifinals, and then they take four out of the semis to the finale, grand finale. Yeah. Oh baby! So where are you heading next after this, and what's kind of on the on the schedule over the next few weeks for you? Yeah, uh, so that's really the next time I'll compete, I guess. Um, there's nothing this weekend, and then mm -hmm. the same weekend that the finals is on, there's some jackpots and a couple of amateur rodeos, and um, so we might be pretty busy there. I got a couple colts with me, so oh, yeah. I'd like to take them and uh, you know, kind of get them a little seasoned and whatnot. So. We'll do that, and then uh, San Antonio. I'm there the 12th to the 14th uh, in that set, and then I'm gonna go to Tucson probably, and then back for the semis and short round at San Antonio, and then Houston. That's uh, run. Yeah, I think uh, I think I'm at Houston. Yeah, the the last part of February there, first nice. set. Mm-hmm. Right on. So I want to hop back to 2023 before we get back into some 2024 stuff. Um, obviously, it was a huge season for you making the CFR again, qualifying for your first Wrangler FR. Um, I thought there was a bit of drama along the way, as we all know, but I want to hear about it through your lens. Talk a bit about some of the ups and downs and some of your favorite moments from 2023. Yeah, it was uh, pretty crazy, you know. Um, I said to yesterday, I was just thinking about like back to a year ago today, like how much different it was. And, <laughs> um, you know, it's kind of crazy what a year can do for you. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I already got more money won this year than I do <laughs> than I did last year. So Atta boy. It, it's looking up for this year. Um, but, no, I mean, obviously the Houston deal um, was a pretty big low. And then, um, you know, three months later to come back and win in Calgary is pretty big high for me and qualify for my first NFR. Um I learned a lot last year um, about everything rodeo and in life and whatnot. So, um, you know, a guy can't ever um, look down on those things. And, um, you know, even the, the challenges that you face are uh, what's going to make you better in the future. So, um, you know, it seems like if you, if you're wanting to learn patience, well, you might have to do some things that aren't, uh, <laughs> aren't aren't what you're thinking when you're learning patience but uh in the end they'll they'll in turn give you that so i feel like some of those type of things is is what i learned um and just yeah um i had a lot of fun last year and um i got got some more horsepower this year and so i'm looking for it to be pretty fun and yeah just happy to happy to keep roping calves well, you, you mentioned Houston, and I'm sure you're sick of talking about it at this point. But I, I just want to ask, how did you how did you block out all the noise from that event? Like, there everybody and their dog seemed to have an opinion on what should have went down or what happened, and and it, it kind of takes a lot to to keep your head down and get back to work. Like, about how how hard was it to keep your eye on the prize? Like you said you came back and won Calgary a few months later, and and it takes some mental fortitude to be able to 
to head down that path? Yeah. Um, you know, it was kind of a, I don't know, like as to say, it was kind of like a, a last straw for me, but at like the same time, it was like almost what I needed to, to kind of be like, you know what? I'm freaking going to do this. Like everything seems like it's working against me right now. And I'm going to bear down and, and make sure that, I, that I do this. And if I don't do it, I'm going to at least say that, you know, I give it, give it 110% mm -hmm. effort. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, there was a lot going on, you know, people, everybody was talking about it there for a long time and <laughs> yeah. it was the, the biggest mm -hmm. drama in the rodeo world, but, I mean, everybody's had one of those uh, kind of calls go for them or against them. And, and so, you know, it wasn't really nothing new. It just happened to be that it was for 50000 and the biggest win of my career. So, <laughs> and, and, and my first first biggest win. So, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it wasn't like I'd done it for, for 10 or 15 years. But, um, no, I, I mean, you can't really get caught up in the drama and, and – uh, you know, if I would have been speaking my opinion all over social media and what I had to say, you know, um, there there wouldn't be as many people that would probably be pulling for me, you know, <laughs> or uh, thinking I'm such a nice guy. But um, at the end of the day, I mean, it didn't really change who I was. I was going to be the same old Bo Cooper the next day, regardless if mm -hmm. I if I won or not. So it didn't change me. It was just something that kind of sucked. And unfortunately those things happened. So we had to move on. And, um, you know, I think, I think that was part of what brought more success, you know, throughout the year was, was just being able to accept it and move on and, um, you know, put it in the past. You got to have a short term memory in rodeos is what they always say. So, um, that's what, what I kind of felt like I did anyway. Well, yeah, you, you must have had some like type of confidence coming out of that situation. Like if you like after it all, the, the chips fell where they did, like, you made a good run and you, you made the finals at Houston, which is a big deal for someone in the rookie season. So, I mean, there's got to be, you had to have had like a kind of a boosted confidence amidst all the, the adversity or kind of maybe the downside of it. Yeah, hundred percent. It was a huge boost of confidence and uh, yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't really, uh, they can't really take that away from me that's for sure mm -hmm. um that's what clay elliott told me he said um when i got home i run into him and he said he said regardless you know he said you want it he said you'll have so much confidence from now from that he said there's no telling what you'll win he said i promise you and uh turns out he was right you know <laughs> Well, was that kind of your first like indicator that you're like hey i can i can hang and do well at this level and and again and make a run for the nfr yeah, um, there's kind of been a couple, like, you know, little things um, here and there. You know, I placed at some big jackpots, and, um, you know, in the last the last four years that I've been coming down here. And so then it was kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, I mean, I can kind of do this. And then I won the rookie, and then it was like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm hanging in there, top 30. <laughs> Honestly, I thought top 30 and top 35 was pretty cool. That was what I was the first two years. And, uh, you know, it was pretty crazy to think, you know, just a kid from Stellar and mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're the 30th best calf roper in the world. I mean, it's a pretty high number. And uh, so then, uh, yeah, then after that, I mean, when in Houston, that was like, geez, yeah. I mean, I'm, I can do I this can, now. I can do this, yeah. And then not even – that but then that same week um i had to go back to the semifinals at austin and uh that was like kind of a crazy deal because everybody kind of knew it was knew what <laughs> all of a sudden you're the most popular guy in rodeo uh, you got people coming up you don't even haven't even spoke to and everybody's kind of looking at you and it was like whoa this is a little crazy like <laughs> so that first calf was kind of hard to run and fortunately i did good and then i Got a little more confidence. I'm like, yeah, you know what? You can't can't keep me down. And then I made the short round, and uh, I think I was maybe second or third out in the short round, and uh, went seven, eight, and ended up winning third of all of Austin. So that that was a big confidence booster to come back and do that. That was like, okay, yeah, you're you can do it. You belong. So 
and yeah that was that was probably a lot of a lot of where my confidence come from and um for the rest of the year I want to ask about uh Shane Hanchi you guys have obviously become pretty good buddies over the years he's rodeoed up with Canada quite a bit and and he, he was a pretty vocal supporter kind of through the whole Houston thing and and he has been through your career like talk a bit about your relationship with him and, and how that came to be and and where you guys are at now yeah, well, these are uh, his 14 back numbers hanging <laughs> and a uh, couple of Taylors. But, um, no, him and him and Taylor both, both have been uh, kind of the reason for all of it. Um, without them, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at today or, or done any of the things that I've done today. So, um, yeah, I mean, they've been a huge blessing and um, have kind of taken me under their wing. And, and Shane's like a big brother to me. He uh, – he looks out for me and, and wants what's best for me. Um, he come up there in 18 and 19 and did a couple of roping schools and I attended them and, um, we got to be good friends after that. And then the winter of 2020, um, I started coming down every winter since then. Um, a couple of times I've come in the fall and, uh, yeah, just tried to get better. Iron sharpens iron. So, you know, I, my cousin Zeke Thurston, I've always hung around him and then I got hanging around Shane and all of a sudden I'm hanging around, you know, everybody else that's made the NFR and I've got to be great, great friends with them and people that have gold buckles and, um, you know, the Haven Medjid, Ty Harris, mm -hmm. all kinds of people like that. And so um, that's just, that's where, if you're wanting to go to the NFR and do what we do, that's the kind of people you need to be around and um, they're going to help you level up your game without you even knowing it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I can't say enough good things about Shannon Taylor and, and what they've done for me. Well, how, how is that, like that kind of that field of guys that have competed in Canada over the past five to 10 years, even like kind of a, increased the quality of tie down ropers in, in the country. Like uh, you say, iron sharp, it's iron. And, and there's a lot of good young tie down ropers coming up their ranks. And, and I feel like having those guys, compete up here on our week in week out has had a really big impact on that yeah i think so too um you know it seemed like the early 2000s um the calf open was like the the best event at the nfr and, and mm -hmm. everybody you know loved to watch it and nobody was leaving until it was done and uh i want to say this year at the nfr it, it seemed like it was right back the early 2000s you know haven he roped absolutely amazing mm -hmm. through 10 rounds and just a crazy outstanding performance by him. And even Riley Webb, like he was, I think he was right there knocking on the door of Shane's mm -hmm. old average record too. And, uh, you know, for, for him to keep a, a level head with Haven breathing down his neck like that and still come out on top and win the world. I mean, he had to rope his butt off too. It wasn't no day off and, uh, tough. I think he tied four or five calves under seven, two. Yeah. Like, he was rolling. I mean, it was just nuts the the performance that that was put on by them guys. Um, I wasn't really, I wasn't really doing nothing too crazy, but <laughs> it was fun watching anyhow. And uh, but no, I think that's had a huge impact. And um, you know, down here it seems like everybody just wants to rope calves in Texas, and um, you know, there's so many good guys coming up that it's like. You know, it'd be crazy to see with the next five years, like who makes the NFR every year, you know, mm -hmm. like there might be three or four new guys every year just because there's so many guys that rope so good now and so many kids coming up that that are getting their permits and um, buying their cards and whatnot. So, um, yeah, there's dang sure uh, a lot of talent that's come up and it's definitely it's cool. It's cool. To, yeah, it's cool. Cool. Cool to see it happening. It's, it's awesome. Like it's I feel even from the CFR and the NFR, it was, it's been some of the best competition that we've seen over the past, like in the last few years, you know, like the, the CFR this year was great. And, and obviously the NFR had had some huge moments as well. Yeah. Yeah. The, I think it'll be kind of cool to see the CFR go back to Edmonton and mm -hmm. see what that does early October. Um, you know, it might, I think, I think it's going to be for the better. Um, I know there's yeah. been a lot of popular opinions on it, but. I personally think it'll be good um, to be in a venue like that. And, and you might get some more of the guys from down here to come up, up there, mm -hmm. uh, being it's early October. 
And so, I mean, <laughs> that's what everybody likes to see is, uh, is good, good rodeo and good performance. Mm-hmm. So to have the best guys in the world is, is, you know, what they're kind of striving for. So I don't blame them for moving it and trying to make it bigger and better every year. Well, let's, and let's talk about last year's CFR. So you, it was a bit of a slower start for you, but near the end, you kind of ramped it up and got going. Like talk about your week, the week in Red Deer and, and, do you feel any pressure from the year before? Like you had a lot of success in 2022. Um, did any of that creep in on you or what, what, what was it like in Red Deer for you last year? Well, so that's, you know, I just kind of had a little breakthrough here the other day that, um, <laughs> that it finally felt like it was kind of a weight off my shoulders. Um, mm. I feel like from the CFR this year, um, I was roping from then till just here this last week. I was kind of roping um, defensively, per se, I guess. Hmm. And, you know, trying not to screw up, trying not to do anything wrong. I felt like I had a lot of eyes on me personally. And, you know, whether I did or not, I think that was just self-inflicted pressure that I put on myself. And, uh, yeah, so so do, in doing that, I, I felt like I didn't want to screw up and, you know, wasn't wasn't just trying to rope like how I rope all the time I was backing off the barrier and and so I think that's what had a lot to do with the NFR too and uh that and then yeah I mean it just it was it just felt like a whole a whole Mm -hmm. new situation that I've never really been in before and so you know we like we would go to some jackpots and whatnot and they always do some Calcuttas up there at those jackpots and they're like and whatever and this year it was like you know i was just i knew i was getting picked first in the calcutta (laughs) like it would go for a thousand and i just knew my name was coming and for whatever reason you know that just it was kind of adding up like like people were expecting me to win Mm -hmm. and in my own head and i i didn't need to put that pressure on myself you know i'm doing this for me and and you know this is what i love to do i don't you know i don't need to be worried about what other people are thinking so i uh i kind of had that little epiphany the other day and i feel a lot better i feel like there's a monkey off my back now (laughs) you know i'm gonna start roping more on the offense and and trying to win and do my best every time rather than trying to screw up and that's it's funny you mentioned that not to screw up sorry yeah well it's funny you mentioned that because you you can kind of see it like i remember watching you in strathmore you're like one of the last few guys out can 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 win the deal and and you like you went after that in that scenario and and it, it, it's, it's something to be said about that you, and you see in other sports too you want to, you want to be on the offense as much as you can be and, and and I think I think that'll be such a huge thing especially for what you do right you, there's so many things going on you got to keep keep going forward rather than trying to like let things come to you hey eh? yeah exactly and and that's what I kind of uh, you know I was thinking about it and then I was like well you know you know Houston Calgary Pinocchio Strathmore, Medicine Hat, kind of all the places I did good mm. and, and won first or second, you know, I was going at it like, you know, there's no more pressure than being in the final four at Houston and Calgary and <laughs> your first, you know, your first big win. And, you know, I mean, in front of that many people, there's, I mean, I was nervous for sure. But at the, you know, in that moment, I was like, I was like, this is it, you know, just freaking win it you know don't back down leave everything out there at least then you can then you can feel good about yourself and and feel like you give it your all instead of uh, trying to back off and and not not mess up yeah that feeling of like leaving something on the table is like such a tough feeling I know I felt it before in, in previous things and I'm sure everybody every athlete who's competed at a high level has felt that maybe there's instances where they could have given a little more and it's 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 a way better approach. Probably a lot more. It's easier to to kind of walk, move to the next thing if you, if you know you've laid it all out in the line. Yeah, exactly. And that's where I feel like I've learned this year. It's like, it's like the school hard knocks. Like, mm. you know, tell you that, but until you actually live it and do it, you know, that's where you gain experience mm-hmm. and and you're able to apply it. And then it's ingrained in your mind, and you're like, okay, well, we're not gonna do that next time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you learn a lot better than when somebody just tells you oh yeah oh yeah okay yeah 
you know and so um like even at Pinoca this year um in the final four uh Bo Pickett I think his calf got up or he maybe missed or something he got no time anyway and so I mean at Pinoca they give they give ground money you have to get a time in the final four to get to get paid and so you know I was the next roper and so I'm like well he's out of it I said now you just need a time like I had her great calf and I kind of went at her when I got down to it. I put two wraps on her instead of one. And I, the whole time I was planning to put one on her just cause she was so amazing, like never kicked. And, you know, I got back on my horse. And I'm like, I don't know if that was the right move. Like I knew I was getting money, but I was like, also knew that I should have probably just won it too. And I end up being nine one. Haven comes right behind me. He ties me. We're nine one. And then Ty Harris goes, and he's nine flat, and gets us by one tenth. And then I was like, man, you know, I'm happy for Ty. He's, he's a good buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was just like that moment. I was like, hmm, should have put it's a wrap right in there. there. Like, yeah. There and there's another, you know, six or seven thousand right there. Mm-hmm. And then you know it gets down to it at the CFR. You know, then I've got another chance to to win a Canadian title, but. You know, you look back on those things and it's easy to say, yeah, I mean, it's just little things like that learning throughout Listen, the year. And it's like learning how to win. Like I, I talked to Zeke about this, it's funny, like the, about this part of it too, where he's like had to find ways, different ways to win and that through that adversity. And I think it comes, like you said, that school of hard knocks and like those situations where it's like you're putting that same situation again, you've learned your lesson, you're not dwelling on it, but you're you're using it as a tool to become, like take that next step as a champion. And I think that's, that's what separates the high level guys like like just like you or Zeke or them guys who 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 want to win that that they they find those different ways to win in different scenarios. Yeah, exactly. And that that all comes from just competing. I mean, mm-hmm. um, I've had a lot of people ask me like, you know, like what what can I do to get better and it's like enter like mm-hmm. you figure it out like <laughs> they're like you know oh, i don't have enough money it's like yeah i've, I've been there like <laughs> you, you just have to, you have to enter because that's where you figure things out like you can rope mm-hmm. in the practice and as much as you want and, and you know you need to but there's just a different you know train of thought and um a lot of different lessons that can be learned when you put your own money up you're in front of people you're in front of crowds you're uh roping for big money you're roping in short rounds you know it's soft they're open soft they're open tough you know it's just you you can't replace that aspect of it um for for learning how to win and and for getting confidence when you do go to the rodeos well it's it's funny because i kind of think of it like as as a golf in a sense where like I'll have times that I'm at the driving range and I'm striping it around, like hitting it better than I ever hit it. And I go play the round and it's like a completely different scenario. And I find the more I actually play actual golf is where you find it, where I'm finding improvement and you find it in your game, which I think is similar to what you're saying about the practice pen. And, and like, it's good to do it and it's good to like, like kind of refine your game, but having it, ha- being in the game and like having those different scenarios, like with rodeo, it could be raining, it could be a different pen of calves. Like there's so many different factors that you're not getting at home in the practice scenario. So it's, it's interesting that you say that. Like, but again, it all boils down to that um, finding different ways to win in different scenarios and putting yourself in those situations where you have the pressure. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you know, you, you never know what you're going to get into when you go to a roping. So, um, you know, you might end up with the best calf in the short round and, and you know it's a tough tough roping well now you got to go at it and and try to win you know whatever you can win or you get to where you don't have a very good calf and the roping's pretty soft well now you got to figure out how to get by her and and either win first or second or third or fourth whatever you feel like you can do and so i mean there's just so many different scenarios when when you get there and that's where i think people need to learn look at at jackpots and and you know amateur rodeos or or i mean in canada we can't go to the amateur rodeos if we're um have our pro card which I yeah, think is yeah. silly but um <laughs> it uh yeah just like you need to look at that as like a kind of a step up from practicing for for when you get to the rodeos you know if you're if you're trying to make the cfr or the nfr you know it's it's just more training and um Obviously, if you're trying to make a living like I'm doing with a rope, then 
you got to go to as many jackpots as you can too, because you can win a lot of money at those as well. So we've kind of touched on on it and and went over like briefly, briefly kind of reference some things from the NFR, but I, I kind of want to get into it and, and talk a bit, a bit about the whole experience. But the first thing I want to ask is, what was your feeling when you, you when you knew you officially had qualified for your first NFR and the entry date and all kind of stuff? Like, what was what was going through your mind? How did it feel? <laughs> it was cool. I was ready to be home. I was like, finally, it's over. You know, <laughs> it's a time it was, off. It was like so after I guess after the Fourth of July. Um, so going, I guess going into June, I had mm-hmm. like twenty thousand. Um, I was maybe top fifty or something. And then after the 4th of July, I'd won quite a bit. And I think I was maybe 19th or 20th in the world. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay, like I need to, you know, bear down and do this. And then I won Calgary. And then uh, that was all that I won in July, honestly. I won Calgary. I I guess it would have been probably like Strathmore, but it's a hat after that, probably. Yeah. That's funny. I think I won one more check in July, but uh, it was funny. (laughs) I, I Harris said the same thing. He's like, He's like, yeah, after I won the American, it was kind of just like for two weeks, I didn't really care. And it was just like, this is so cool. <laughs> and and he's like, then I had to get back to business and, and focus again. And that was kind of the same with me. So, but then I was in a pretty good spot. I think I was maybe seventh or eighth kind of end of July, but it wasn't over. I think I had 82 or 83,000 and it took 113,000 to make it. So I still had to win 30,000 which is quite a bit of money still. It's no small feat, and it's kind of getting no. down to the, the, the make or break point of the season. Exactly, yeah. And and so um, then all of August, I just chipped away. I kind of ducked off a little and went to some smaller rodeos. I had a lot of rodeos left on my rodeo count. And so um, I think I went to like 36 rodeos in August. Wow. Um, and so then I ended up winning like, uh, what was it, maybe 6,000 a week in August. And so then I thought too bad. I, too bad. Oh, it, was, it was good. I was, and it was like, it was just like a thousand, fifteen hundred at a time. It was a lot of fourths and fifths. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it would, I, I drew up good and I would get to points where it was just like, okay, like first is tough, win second or third, you know, and then I'd win third or fourth or something like that. And so that's, uh, I was, I was actually pretty dialed in there and, and roping good. And then, I want to say it was after the after Puyallup, after the tour finals there, it was like kind of an oh shit moment for me. I was, <laughs> I got nervous. <laughs> I didn't I didn't have really that many rodeos that I was going to that I'd entered because I was just like it was getting towards the end of the season. I'm like, okay, I'm ready to be done. Like, and then pretty much everybody that needed to win at Pendleton in the tour finale won, and so then. <laughs> There's like 20 guys, you know, or like the top 20 have a chance to make the NFR. Mm-hmm. And I was like ninth or 10th. And then all of a sudden I was 14th. And I'm like, oh boy. Like, <laughs> and I got nervous. And so then I didn't win nothing for that week. And then um, I won 3,000 at uh, Albuquerque. And then I was like, okay, I feel a little better about that. And then I went to San Bernardino and Poway, won a little more money. And then I think I had 117 at that point. And I'm like, okay, like, I feel like I'm in, you know, I just yeah. got to wait for October 1st. And then, um, so yeah, then I ended up finishing 11th. And uh, yeah, October 1st was just like this big sense of relief. <laughs> like, oh, finally, like mm-hmm. the stress is over and, um, you know, then it was a lot of excitement after that and Mm -hmm. got to call in i think october 17th maybe i called in and entered the nfr wrote down my confirmation that was that was a pretty cool day for me that's pretty awesome especially like i never realized the grind you had to go through the back half of the season there like that's got to be like such a rewarding and even the the adversity you went through early in the season it's like the culmination of all that just to be able to Mm -hmm. like write that confirmation i'm down like yeah this like everything was worth it it was like kind of like yeah exactly it was it was a lot of like big sense of relief like wow this is i did it you know huge accomplishment Mm -hmm. you know but yeah those last three weeks of september were (laughs) killing me a little western that's yeah and that that's something else i learned too like i was so worried so stressed about it like yeah which i mean it was my first time you know yeah there was a lot riding on it (laughs) like 
a lot of pressure that felt like helpless pressure. Like there wasn't nothing I could do about mm-hmm. it. And, you know, everybody else seemed like they were entered in 14 rodeos and I was entering three. And so it was <laughs> like, it was like, wow, you know, <laughs> what am I going to do? But, um, you know, I learned like that too. Like you can't control it. I mean, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if that guys win more money than me and beat me, I mean, it wasn't meant to be, you know, <laughs> it worked out the way it was supposed to work out. So, you know, you can't let things like that, you know, control your mind and get you down on the road and, and beat you up like that for three weeks, you know? So who, how, like, how are you leaning on like Taylor and Shane during those times? Like how, how big of a help were they like helping you navigate um, kind of that scenario and, and that, that time leading into the last few weeks of the season? You know, um, while Shane let me ride his horse, you know, my good horse was, pretty tired by the end of the summer so Shane let me ride his good horse Bugsy one horse of the year and he let me ride Cy Pendleton so um that was kind of a sense of relief you know it hadn't been going great for me in seven there for a week or so you know he was just tired and we were kind of fighting it so um I got on him and and so that was great for um me to just kind of not worry about my roping per se and and just go rope so that was good but other than that I didn't really lean on him a whole lot I maybe should have you know asked Shane a a few more questions about what I should do but (laughs) that was the other thing is I was kind of just like wanting to not talk to anybody about it you know I just want to get over with and and be kind of off by myself but you know looking back I probably should have talk to Shane and Zeke about it a little more and, you know, just relaxed, had mm-hmm. fun, enjoyed well, it. And, well, that's good. You had the epiphany kind of at that point of the season two of like, okay, well, there's nothing you, like it's out of my control. Like the only thing I can do is what I can do. So I just, mm-hmm. I'll just bust my ass and the chips will fall where they may. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's all you can do it every time. So yeah. <clears throat> at least I got that knowledge now and, and <laughs> yeah, we're moving we're moving forward and hope <laughs> uh so fast forward into into december the first the first round of the nfr what's what's that feeling as you're riding the thomas and the mac for the first time what's going through your mind how nervous are you what's what's going on the grand entry was was badass it was so much fun right in there and finally see the bright lights and everybody you know screaming and um you know that was i'll never forget that that was so cool and that's what everybody says is like the first grand entry is is the the funnest Mm -hmm. part of the whole whole 10 days you know or you know the whole your whole career is the grand entry the first time so um we didn't even practice it because of (laughs) the shooting yeah that's right yeah which was unfortunate but they uh we knocked it out of the park with the grand entry the first time no practice we might do that every time now i don't know (laughs) (laughs) um so that was fun and then obviously the first round didn't go how i wanted it to but <laughs> that was a little embarrassing it was yeah. 20 in your first round but oh well was, what do you do it kind of fit with the uni home so <laughs> well and before we get into like the competition side of it i want to ask how uh how did you navigate the chaos of the 10 days of your first nfr i know there's a lot of kind of requirements and a lot of obligations that you have whether it be to sponsors family friends that type of thing how how, did you find it easy to navigate that? Did you kind of find time to hide out? Or what did you do as you went through the 10 days? Yeah, um, it was pretty new for me. Um, it was a lot of fun, though, like doing signings and, and interviews and stuff. Um, I like talking to people and, and being, you know, friendly. So um, that wasn't too big of a deal for me. I'm sure when you've done it for 10 or 15 years, it gets <laughs> – the worst part about it was everybody coming up and telling you – had you picked on your fantasy team and then, you know, oh, I was like, the pressure of that would be tough because i've like i picked my fantasy team i was like Fuck, these guys better do good yeah exactly and yeah uh, by the end of it i was like well i picked me on my fantasy team you don't think i was trying to win <laughs> <laughs> obviously i wanted to do good like right? but no i mean i had a great um support system i had my ad uh cousin adam shuckberg he come down uh, he's Ryan's little brother. And, uh, so he kind of looked after my horses and helped me with that. And then, um, I had some people working on my horses that, uh, did a, did a great job paradigm equine. They, uh, 
worked on both seven and Catalina for me. And uh, my girlfriend was out there and, and she was there for the whole 10 days helping us to whatever I needed. And so that was great. And my mom and dad and my sister um, were there and, and cheering and supporting me. And um, that was fun to have them and could go over there. My they they got like a little condo type deal, and so my dad yes. would make breakfast, breakfast a couple of times. So it's kind of nice to just go over there and have mm-hmm. good home cooked breakfast, and just be able to hang out with them and kind of not worry about the rest of it. And so, um, yeah, it was cool to do that. And then obviously Zeke's whole family was there too. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it was pretty cool that um, us cousins were were entered and then for me to do good finally on the 10th night and him to win his fourth world title that was a pretty fun night afterward we we had a lot of fun <laughs> uh pretty cool to kind of end the week and the year on that mm-hmm, on a mm-hmm. high and uh you know that's that's the moments that everybody kind of lives for and it makes that's what i said by the end of the week you know i was like well shit i would have went to 10 rodeos in the summer and uh won eighteen thousand and called it a good week you know like, <laughs> yeah i did it in one night yeah i did it one night it mm-hmm. turned out to be a not so bad week so um yeah no it was it was a good first experience and mm-hmm. um, i look forward to doing it again hopefully have a little more success in the arena but well and i want how did you how did you keep your kind of po- yourself positive going through that like obviously it can't be easy when you when you have obviously have a high standard for yourself competing wise and, and you and you you deserve to be there you're one of the, the top 15 title numbers in the world but how did you how did you keep a positive attitude and then ultimately be able to throw down that good run in the last round um you know honestly i i didn't um i it's tough like mm-hmm. it for the first you know half i was pretty positive and then towards the second half it was like you know what do I even do? Do I even like know how to rope? Like, <laughs> I just felt like one thing after the other, you know, it wasn't one. Um, well, I mean, it, in an aspect, it was one certain thing, um, which was missing the barrier every night, but it wasn't the same thing that happened every night. Like one night I'd, you know, drop my hooey or miss a front leg or miss flank one or, um rope one deep and then not get a very good go or be late or break the barrier um so i mean it was just like one thing after the other and you're just like when is this ever going to end you know Mm -hmm. so i honestly you know by the end of it that's where you like you got to have a good support team that that is there for you because i was i did not have a very good attitude you know i was ready to go home by the seventh or eighth (laughs) round you know this is bad enough but um we stuck it out anyways and Mm -hmm. and you know the tenth round that you, I made that run and I was like, shit, that was easy. Like, why didn't I just do it <laughs> what the other night? Yeah, <laughs> and that's the funny thing about that place, you know, is I've heard other people say it too, but like, if you get a good start, it's easy. Like, mm-hmm. there's not much to it. I mean, they're right there in front of you, and if you just go through the motions and just do what you do, um, I'm not saying you're gonna win round after round but you're gonna make good runs and you're gonna have fast times so um that's what it felt like in the 10th round to me and I didn't didn't really stay as positive as I should have you know but I tried to keep my chin up and and not let the let the negatives get me down I just I wasn't you know I wasn't just excited to go run another one when you know I probably should have um but I mean, eight nights of getting your butt kicked on national. Wear on anybody. That'll wear on anybody. I don't care who <laughs> you are. Much. It's not that <laughs> fun. Yeah, but One, and it's a good way to put a cap on it, like having that success and the kind of we talked about with the Houston thing. It's gives you some confidence, like heading into what's next and into the next season. It's like, okay, well, I can hang. I know I can hang with these guys, and I've proven it now. So I think, yeah, next time around, you'll have a lot more success. Exactly. Yeah, and and that's what I kind of thought too. And if I would have had a good national finals and one hundred eighty thousand. you know i might be a cocky little guy right <laughs> you know and but now i'm kind of got my butt whooped and it made me go okay well we gotta fix some things and mm-hmm. i need i need to work on this and work on that and you know i i feel like i'm better off in the long run 
having that happen to me rather than than just stepping in there and winning all the yeah. I feel like uh, in the long run that this will be better for me than than the other. Uh, before we move on to the NFR, I want to ask about the I can't remember what round it was, but the record baker ground when when Haven was six and four, and then Shad was had a calf kick out to be six and one. Did I want to hear from your perspective what was it like watching those two heavyweights throw down? And the whole the whole round was really fast, so I want I want to know what it was like for you to watch that unfold. That <clears throat> that was badass. Haven was first roper, and Shad was second roper, and so I was I think I was maybe the second last or last roper that night. And, uh, so I was up there standing right behind the box watching the start and Haven went and we were like, everybody's just, holy man, like, did that really just happen? And, uh, you could hear it on TV. I, I yelled at him to throw his hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was like, if you don't throw your hat, I'm going to Haven. But yeah, no, that was, that was so cool. And then, you know, Shad he rode in the box and um that calf wasn't supposed to be very good Mm -hmm. and uh but that guy he he don't it don't really matter to him he makes him good if he wants something he's gonna he's gonna try to get it and so i mean he wiped him a start and had it on her and everybody that was standing behind the box like you can see the score clock kind of like behind them guys when they're tying and when he threw his hands in the air, it was said something like five six or five oh seven or something. God. And so, like, obviously, there's a delay, you know, by the time they drop the flag and mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. Hit button, and then it stopped at six one. And it, it was honestly like quiet for a second. Like everybody's like, "There's no way that just happened." And then, <laughs> yeah. and then it just erupted that place. Yeah. Well, I remember that, I remember the camera pan to Haven. He, he, he couldn't you could see the shock <laughs> on his face too, right? <laughs> oh yeah, I got a screenshot of that on my phone. It's hilarious. <laughs> that's his contact picture in your phone. Yeah, I'm gonna. <laughs> I should switch. I got a different one that's hilarious for him. But yeah, I should switch that to his contact. <laughs> that would oh. be funny. Oh man, that's awesome. But yeah, and then well, shit. I think there was a six eight or six nine in that mm-hmm. round too. Like just crazy. I think Rushton was seven five or seven six and he won fifth i believe yeah i think he won mm-hmm. last yeah i think you're right i think you're right I have to, i'd have to pull it up to look at it but and i remember him roping like he walked back to his horse and it was like silence it was like <laughs> holy man that's you know, too slow just, dude yeah like it's crazy like <laughs> seven six is a fast run and but i mean it was just overshadowed by six one six four six eight yeah. you know seven five seven one I mean, it was nuts. That was one of the best rounds of calf roping, if not the best. Mm-hmm. Now that that'll hype anybody up. I don't care who you are. It's pretty cool yeah. stuff. Badass. So heading into twenty twenty four, and you, you kind of met, touched on a little bit how like the adversity you went through that at the NFR is kind of like kind of prodded you a little bit to kind of get to get things happening and get to work. So so what are you doing outside of the arena and and obviously then the practice pens and others kind of stuff to kind of take that that next step and, and, and be one of the top dogs for a long time. What what are you doing? Um, yeah, trying to get, uh, some more horsepower lined up. Mm -hmm. That's uh, crucial having a lot of horsepower and, uh, it just makes your job so much easier. I mean, you look at Haven, he rides some of the best horses Mm -hmm. and I mean, he, it makes his job a heck of a lot easier to, know that he can get a good start every time and they're going to pull and um, he can get good goes off of them. I mean, that plays as much into your mental as anything. I mean, yeah, not having to worry about, well, is my horse going to screw me this time? Just be or, able to concentrate on roping and not as much yeah, on the exactly. horsemanship side of things. Yeah, for sure. And so I'm mm-hmm. um, going to try to get some more horsepower. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we're going to go work out with uh, Andrew Shea. He is part of Rodeo Performance Network and, so yeah, he just lives not far from here. Mm-hmm. I'll go me and Shana, Bo Peterson. She stays here too, and so yeah, we'll go over there a couple times a week and mm-hmm. and work out. Um, I really need to get uh, more flexible, a little more. Oh, interesting. That's good. Uh, yeah, yeah. I uh, since Shane makes me drive so much all the time, I'm pretty stiff and. And, not the hip, and the hips part are probably like super stiff, where that's a big part of what you guys do because all the crazy yeah, exactly. movements you got to do, right? exactly i actually i have super tight hamstrings so um, interesting 
yeah, I maybe need to get them worked on, but yeah, I would like to get a little more flexible and nice. uh, not even so much just for roping, but just for staying injury prone for as a guy gets older. They say it doesn't get any easier as you get older, so. Yeah, that's a fact, man. Yeah, I've, I'm, I'm into my I'm into my 30s now, and everything seems a little bit a little bit harder, no matter what I try to do. <laughs> um, yeah. One one thing I want to I want to ask too is, uh, so why did you end up taking up tie down roping and not saddle rock riding when you when you got the Thurston's as cousins? Do they give you shit sometimes here and there? Have you ever give, given it a try? I, I I had a friend, my friend Robert Schmidt, asked me to ask this to you, so I want to. Yeah, wanna... uh, I was just too good at bronc riding. I wanted Zeke to have some success, so uh, I just let him let him take up that role and um try to do something that's a little more harder and <laughs> and physically demanding than bronc riding that's too easy uh, zeke took the easy route and uh, he said calf rope is too complicated for him so <laughs> hey yeah. i I, I, like, I like it that's the that's the perfect answer i think i think a lot of people will yeah. appreciate that especially on the, the timed event side of things yeah um, exactly. Just um, so just ask Clay. He's he's taking up a calf roam. He said it's the hardest event he's done. Dude, I the summer I quit riding bulls. I like was living in like near Nant and I was doing that I that Nant and night rodeos. And mm -hmm. uh I taught myself how to rope calves and it was the hardest thing I've ever done, dude. It was like yeah. I think the fastest I got was like 19 seconds, and but it was like <laughs> I don't know how the fuck you guys do it at that the sat speed and stuff. So it's pretty impressive. Yeah. It's just so intricate. Like literally everything has to go right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's crazy, but I'm not the Bronco. Riding, I mean, I would get <laughs> dumped on my head 30 times in a row, if not more, but I would I say, I would say that out of the learning curves and rodeo events, tie down roping, saddle bronc riding, got to have some of the steepest. Like I've, I knew guys when I amateur rodeoed a lot that they rode saddle bronc courses for years and, and they took them so long to figure it out. And then, but it's gotten the same with tie down roping that you said it's so intricate there's lots of moving parts you're on a horse you're jumping mm -hmm. off the horse you've got two different ropes going on or three different ropes at the time with the jerk down line but yeah it's crazy yeah but and then you know them guys that that get good at bronc riding they make it look so easy and oh effortless yeah. like it's insane it's so it's so cool to watch honestly bronc riding's my favorite event to watch like, I, I agree 100 percent, man if, yeah if i'm at a rodeo somewhere i'm it's usually right before the calf open and I'll, I'll have my horse like walk up and, and kind of ready so that I can just sit there and watch the bronc ride. <laughs> Cause I, I just love watching it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, especially, you know, having Zeke be um, in the bronc riding too. I mean, it's yeah. cool to watch. And, and he that's, makes that's, it. That's a guy who makes it look really easy. Oh, crazy. he's, he's the goat, that guy. But yeah. What was it, no. what was it like watching him, him ride explosive skies in round five? I um, had a that. moment for you. Yeah. Is that uh, you could hear it through the TV, like I said this before, but like you could hear how loud that building was through the TV. It was pretty, pretty oh, remarkable. It was, yeah, no, it was a lot of fun. Right on, man. Well, before we wrap this up, I just want to ask what, what are what are what are some of your goals for 2024 and what can we expect at out of Bo Cooper this this new season? You know, I'm gonna try to work on on being more present in the moment and where I'm at. Uh, I'm gonna try to work on being a more offensive roper and and kind of going at them a little more other than that i'm gonna yeah those are kind of my two main goals and just try to try to work on um how the hell did i word this i guess trying to just do do the best with what you got sometimes you're gonna win first sometimes you're gonna win fourth i'm just trying to be more consistent you know make make every run the best that it that it can be whether i'm going to place or not um and i think that that that's going to carry on and and work out in my favor you know by the end of the year i think it'll be i'll have a lot of success come from that i'm not so much worried about you know winning championships or or anything like that you know i don't have any goals set like that mm -hmm. i'm just kind of more focused on the steps and what it takes to to do good well, and that's the, that's the steps that lead you to being a champion though. I think you, you, those are the foundation and the building blocks. And if you, if you really hone those in and find a way to, to kind of achieve those goals, the championships are just going to come with it. Yeah. That, and that's something that I've kind of learned too. You can't, my mom always says you can't chase the carrot. So yeah, I've kind of, I've kind of learned to, to do away with, you know, the hard and fast, you know, I'm going to win Calgary. I'm going to win Canadian title you know, in the average title, whatever it may be, you know, and I've kind of tried to 
more focus on the the steps of what it takes to be successful and and you know i think that's going to lead me farther than than being so focused on the end goal that that you miss everything in between that well, man, I, I have no doubts that you're going to find that that success you're looking for and that you're chasing. And, and I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. I had a blast. It was super fun. And and we, we hope you have a great season. And I'll see you down the trail this season, I'm sure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, YC. Appreciate it. We'll see you somewhere. Yeah, for sure, buddy. All right. Well, this has been episode number six of the short round. We will be right back after this. Welcome back to the short round. Thanks again to Bo Cooper for joining us. We wish him all the best in 2024 and he is sure going to kick some ass. I can imagine. All right, Tanner, we, we had a, we talked about it in the last show. Um, Austin Broderson, young bareback rider, got himself in a bit of a wreck down in Denver. Um, it's kind of a scary situation, but thankfully he's on the mend and he made his way back home uh, last week. He had a bit of an update, a bit of an update for us. Yeah, I, ta- I was texting uh, Austin this morning. He got home back to Canada on Sunday. He's got to heal up a little bit more before he can start his physio on his arm. There's a bunch of nerve damage in his left arm. Um, he currently doesn't have a feeling in it, but they're hopeful with a bunch of physio and stuff. It will come back. And you know what? After watching the wreck, that he's lucky. Yeah. That was one of the worst ones I've ever seen. They set up a GoFundMe with a goal of 30000 and it they knocked that out of the park. It's just about at a hundred thousand right now. So he's a good kid, comes from a good family, an old mm-hmm. rodeo family. And I know his grandpa and his dad and everyone really well. And I kind of grew up in the same era as all them guys. And you know what? Austin's a tough kid and he's going to keep, keep keeping on. And he's uh, the work ethics there. And if anyone's going to put the work in to get better, it'll be Austin. So I look forward to seeing him get better and can't wait to see him down the road again. It's kind of going back to what we were talking about on the top talking about on the top part of the show with these, all these young guys coming up, Austin's one of them guys. He was at the CFR last year, had a really strong performance and, and you can see he has a ton of talent. So it'll be, it'll be we're excited to get him back on the road and wish him all the best in his recovery. And, and like you mentioned, there's a GoFundMe set up for him. Um, I'll be sure to put the link. I think it's still going on. So I'll put the link into the podcast description for y'all to go check it out and, and hopefully help Austin on his way to recovery. Um, so it's during the winter run here uh, down in the PRCA. We have some Canadians kicking some butt. A um, couple guys I want to highlight. Um, Colby Wanchuk, Lucas Moxa. Colby didn't have the best 2023 season. He made the CFR. Kind of didn't go as well for him as he thought. He missed out a couple horses. Um, did the replay challenge and kind of got didn't, didn't go his way. But that's cool to see that we have that. But he's currently fifth in the world standings and, and kind of it's shaping up to be a, a big year for the Rogi Bandit 2024. Yeah, you know what? Kobe's probably one of our most talented guys up here. And yeah. To see his year last year was kind of disappointing for him not making the NFR. And, I mean, by most standards, he had a great year. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'm sure by Kobe's standards, it wasn't as good as he would have liked. But the kid is unreal good. And at that note, he's got a little brother knocking on the door that <laughs> yeah. he had to make his mind up a couple of years ago whether he was going to buy his pro card and the team open and go enter the open or if he's going to stay on his permit and keep entering the novice. Probably wasn't ready to enter the open, but he jumped head in or head first and started entering the open. And last year, mid season, it started cracking for him. And I mean, Kyle, he's just started kicking everyone's butt. And so I think the one chucks are some, both a pair of them to <laughs> joke for. I, I suspect Kyle to be at the CFR this year with his brother Kobe. And if he goes south, there's no telling what, like, as strong as he's come on last year, he could be mm-hmm. at the end too, as well. And like I said, Kobe is second to none. He's one of the best Bronc riders I've ever seen. His ride on Tokyo Bubbles a couple years ago at San Antonio is one of the best Bronc riders I've ever seen. Yeah. yeah. He's uh, he's one to watch for sure. It seems seems like he's kind of shot out of the gate with like a, with a vengeance. So he's here to prove that he's he's still got what it takes to be one of the top guys in the world. And, and I'm excited to watch him throughout the, the rest of the season. Uh, another guy who's had a good start to the year, he's kind of been knocking on the door. I talked a bit about him with is, is Lucas Moxa. He's, he's got all the tools there to be be one of the best. And it just obviously into your troubles hit and, and, and kind of not everything goes everybody's way all the time, but it seems like this could be the year that we see Lucas down in Vegas. And then once again, back at the CFR. Yeah, for sure. You know, last winter, Lucas's winter run was kind of cut short. He got, in kind of a wreck getting off a horse and got kicked and he was out for a while, broke his jaw and that put a damper on his winter run. And he was having a good winter up until then at San Angelo, he got kicked. And then, I mean, that guy is super, super talented. He mm. hardly ever hits the ground and riding percentage wise, he's right up there with the Zeke Thurston's, the 
all them top guys. Um, and he just needs to to get recognized a little more. Like he doesn't yeah, know yeah. points as some of the guys would get. He's kind of quiet. He's quiet. Yeah, he's just business. under the radar. And yeah. I think once Lucas Mox's name gets out there a little more, I think Lucas Mox is going to be hard to beat. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting time. And, and and across the board, we got, I think, like I mentioned on the top of the show, it's an exciting time for Canadian Rodeo. We got, I think, some of the best group of competitors across the board. Like you mentioned, steer wrestling, tie down roping, team roping, bareback riding, saddlebuck riding, bull riding. I think it's going to be an exciting year on both sides of the border for our Canadian athletes. Mm -hmm. And like on your pod with Zeke, like, 10, 11 bronc riders is not unrealistic. Oh, no, no. It's so legit, man. Like, we could almost tie the record for Canadian athletes just in the bronc riding. Just in the bronc riding. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, you got, like, uh, Dawson Dom's off to a great year. You got obviously, like, Zeke, Layton, Ben, Logan, and the Hay Boys. Like, those, that's, you can almost, like, between Zeke, Logan, Dawson, Ben, and Colby, that's, like, almost five locks right yep. there and then you add in those other guys like lucas and dawson and and even kyle wanchuk and and q taylor like there's a lot of it's a, yeah. our like our saddlebunk riding roster in canada is stacked right up another guy like case thompson he's yeah case too yeah come again <laughs> like it's it's crazy it's dawson dom i think dom is one of the most underrated guys in yeah canada. yeah he's that guy going on. real good um on another note it was good to see i watched fort worth some of fort worth that's been going on and our Canadian contingency in the breakaway roping. Um, yeah, our exactly. Canadian champion is down there right now. Um, I don't think it's unrealistic to say we could have three or four breakaway ropers at the NFR next year as well with Kendall and Shelby and Shayla. And mm -hmm. We've got a lot of good ropers. Um, Macy, Claire, and all them are down there. And I think it could be pretty salty in the breakaway roping as well. That's awesome stuff. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, I forgot to mention at the top of the show, is so last year's NFR, Jared Parsonage, Jordan Hansen had a successful – 10 days with Jared finishing, I think fourth or fifth in the average. Jordan got a couple of bulls road, made some big money. You're pretty close to those boys have been for a long time. What was it like for you to watch Jared and Jordan have so much success in Vegas? Well, Jared, it was awesome to see because last year's NFR was so poor. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And Jared, you, you expect him to win first through third in the average everywhere he goes. Like yep. he hardly yep. ever hits the ground. And last year to go one out of nine road, it was pretty disheartening for him. And the one he rode, he didn't place on. So I mean, I, I knew he was going to go hard again last year and make mm -hmm. it so it wasn't a fluke. And to see him do good at it and win a bunch of money was awesome. And Jordan Hansen, that guy's a freak. He, uh, <laughs> it, it's true. Uh, I, yeah. We talked about Tyler Kraft and the opening about ice water in his veins. There is nothing that bothers Jordan Hansen. Mm -hmm. Like he could come out, he could go in Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio right now, wouldn't surprise me at all. He could be season leader this year. He gets his mixture right. And I mean, he, there's no stopping that guy. He's mm -hmm. so, so talented. He's one of the best we've ever seen in Canada. Um, and he's, uh, he just, nothing bothers him. Like he can no. be wiped out, hurt, and he looks the exact same. Like he yeah. hardly ever limps. He hardly ever holds his arm or shoulder. <laughs> and you know he's sore, but he just won't. Like then far, his shoulder was killing him, but mm. no one ever – Knew, he didn't talk about it, so no one knew about it. And he still went out and did his thing and got a few bulls rode and made some money. Um, That's a guy that I would say has a legit shot to ride 10 at the NFR if he gets back there, and I expect him to be back there this year. I think he's going to go for it once more. And, I mean, them guys are starting to get up in the they're numbers. Not young. They're the veterans now, them boys. Yeah, they're the veterans. And I mean, yeah. when I was a veteran, they are kind of the young guys, and I was fortunate enough to go with Jordy and Jared my last year. I went for one more Northwest run with them guys. And just to travel with them too is, is was second to none. They you know they, they pushed a guy and they held the guy accountable. And that was probably the best fall I'd ever had just from going with them too. It was, it was really good to see them do good at the NFR. And I look forward to big things from both of them. And, mm -hmm. and Yeah. I kind of, I, I kind of predicted Jared to have a better NFR with like, obviously with how close him and Jordan are, I can having that sense of like comfort or, like for lack of a better term, like, there with him in Vegas, I think that was really going to help push him to that next level. And then when he rode chiseled for 92 points uh, near the end of the season, I think that was kind of the thing like, Hey, like this guy's going to make some noise. And then like you say, he's one of the most consistent guys we got going. And then obviously Jordan, he, when he's on fire, like he makes rank bulls look so easy, like nobody else. So it was, it was definitely yeah, fun to watch those guys. His legs are the same size as me. And like he put the match <laughs> on the one. And, and yeah. once he's riding good, he, there's no uh -huh. getting away. Uh, I love watching Jordan right away from his hand. He does it better than, than most guys. So yeah, I could ride on the yellow bolt the NFR when he was 88. Oh, man. Awesome. Um, all right. So 
the 50th CFR is coming up in Edmonton. It's, it's a really exciting time. Um, through your lens, how, how awesome is it, is it to be back in Edmonton? I know it's, it means a lot to you and you've been, you've been with Edmonton, you were with Red Deer and now it's kind of back. So what, what's, what's it like through your lens going back to Edmonton? Um, you know what? I think it'll be a great, the venues second to none Rogers place. I mean, we went and did a walkthrough of it and I kind of had a look underneath and seen how steel and setup was going to look. And I think we can do some pretty cool stuff with that end of it. First and foremost, Red Deer, what a great host for the last five CFRs. Um, yeah, hats they off were to them. outstanding. The crew there was great. I developed a bunch of really close relationships in Red Deer with the people on that crew, Chloe and all the crew at Wesner Park. Um, but I mean, Edmonton is where it's been forever. And um, Red Deer, stepped up to the plate when there wasn't a home for it and the way the everything went it ended up going back to Edmonton but I think it's a huge opportunity for rodeo in Canada um mm. we had our first CFR committee meeting yesterday and there's some big things coming down the pipe I think it's going to be a, a great week of rodeo up there um one less perf which is in some minds disappointing but at the same time that's one more perf of money that we can add back to the pot so I, I expect it to be one of the better CFRs we've ever seen. I think it should pay out close to the same as the six rounds. I just, I think that it wouldn't surprise me if we sell that building out Saturday night. I, I really wouldn't surprise me. It's a lot of people. And I was the last guy to ever ride at the CFR in Edmonton in 17. That was my last bowl I ever got on. When I looked up and seen all them people, you know, it was pretty surreal to me that we were leaving Edmonton. But at the same time, to be back, it's a pretty cool feeling to be back in Edmonton and get to be a part of it. It's kind of shaping up to be kind of a, a storybook season, you could say, with it being the 50th CFR back in Edmonton. The city's super excited about it. I know a lot of people in the rodeo community are. So I think, like you say, it wouldn't be surprising if it's like one of the bit biggest CFRs yet. And to be in that iconic building, I think it's really just going to take it to that next level. Yeah, for sure. You know, like everything in that building is state of the art. And mm -hmm. um, the room we have to to explore other options underneath is is huge and I think it's going to be, like I said, there's going to be some challenges with it, like there is with everything. But at the same time, I've watched bulls go down the ramp at Madison Square Garden. So anything's possible. <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty uh, pretty cool to be in one of them iconic buildings in North yeah. America. It's one of the best hockey barns they have in North America. And it's pretty cool to have our season finale at that building. So how much will the, your experience in Red Deer over the past few years help in, in kind of setting up the show? In Edmonton, I know, like, well, I worked with Red Deer too for the last few years. And now working with the Pro Rodeo, I, you kind of see, I kind of been able to see the well-oiled machine that Red Deer's turned into, and I feel like those performances were some of the best kind of ever at the CFR. How are you guys going to take what you guys built there and, and apply it in Edmonton? I think we I just got to keep looking up, you know, mm -hmm. and just because the last, I would say the last three years at Red Deer were some of the best CFR perks I've mm -hmm. been at, but there's always room for growth and that's the biggest thing in rodeo is lots of people get stuck in just the steady eddy line. And if I think if we want to make this thing work and see these kids like Bo Cooper and Bo Gardner and all these young guys coming up, go out and make half a million dollars in Canada, we got to keep pushing the limits. And if we can keep doing that, I think there's, there's no, uh, no boundaries. I think we just got to keep pushing forward and trying to get bigger and better every year. Um, so what what has you most excited about coming back to Edmonton? I know there's probably a lot of things, but what's maybe one or two things that that you're most excited about to be back in Edmonton in, in October? I would say the the biggest thing I'm excited for is just the fan base and the city's excitement to have the rodeo back. Mm -hmm. uh, Edmonton is super, super excited to have another rodeo week. It's it's gonna be a great rodeo. It's gonna be action packed. There's a lot of city support. Um, a lot of provincial support. I mean, lots of that stuff. And just the, the crowd at Edmonton, I mean, you know, it's CFRs, lots of rodeo people that come to CFR every year, no matter where it's at, they all in packs. Like we've been getting calls already about what's happened with the all in packs, but we're getting all that handled right now. And there's a lot of old rodeo fans that'll come there. And just to see, there's people mad that when it went left Edmonton to go to Red Deer, and now there's people mad that's leaving Red Deer going back to Edmonton. So you're yeah. never going to make everyone happy, but at the end of the day, we got to look at what's best for our, mm -hmm. our personnel, our contestants, and our membership as a whole. When I think that it's it's a huge opportunity to kind of expose a whole new generation of fan to the rodeo. It's like with it being away from Edmonton for a while and coming back to like an urban center, like a real, like a truly urban center. 
like a big city like Edmonton, I think that's one thing I'm really excited for is to kind of showcase the best of what we got in rodeo in Canada to obviously like the, the, the core audience, people have been around it for so long, but obviously I think we can bring in a whole new layer of people, but just, just with the interest in Western and general, like you see like the yellow stones and everybody's being cowboy is cool kind of across the yeah. board again. So I think it'd be really cool to, to showcase um, what pro rodeo has to offer to, to these, this new group of folks in, in Edmonton. Yeah, for sure. And when we did the press release, the whole downtown core was at the press release. Yeah. Everyone had their cowboy hats on and their boots on. And I mean, they're excited about it and it's uh it'll be cool to bring the Western way of life downtown Edmonton mm-hmm. and show kind of what we do. There's going to be some challenges with stock and stuff moving back and forth, but it comes with the territory. There's every building like the Texas swing rodeos, all of them have the same challenges and we just got to figure them out. And I'm sure it'll be hiccups in the first year or two, but that's something that uh, you just got to transform and move on with. And if you can't adapt to it, then probably not the job for you, but you got to, just kind of adapt and move on. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't work, try something else and just keep trying until it works. And it's gonna, it's gonna be good. There's no doubt in my mind. I, I've been working a lot with Explore Edmonton and trying to get the steel part of it and the setup part of it down pat. And I think it's uh, as far as the production stuff, like that building has. There's like I said, there's no limits. I've, it's state of the art. It's the best. Yeah, it's around. crazy. Yeah. The yeah. stuff that you do in there. So. Mm-hmm. Okay, Tanner, before we wrap things up this week, we're probably not going to get together before the Super Bowl happens. So I just want to, I, obviously you're wearing a San Fran hat for those who aren't watching and they're listening, but what's your prediction for the Super Bowl in a couple weeks? San Fran 24-7. Really, man? I, I don't think, I, I want to say San Fran, but I just think the fact if Taylor Swift <laughs> wins the Super Bowl is going to be so huge for that FL. So I think the script for the script, I'm going to go with KC. Uh, much of my daughter's dismay, I'm not a Swifty. <laughs> it's it's been pretty crazy the impact she's had on it, but yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Brock Purdy and Christian McCaffrey, and I think it'll be fun. But I don't know. You know what? I wasn't really a San Francisco fan, and then I bought the the trip. Oh, right, at, you uh, went down to the Boston. game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. The game sit in the box, and we got to go right down on the field and watch them so guys. So cool, warm up man. It was it was pretty neat, and that but again another state of the art building, Levi Stadium. Yeah. San Fran is unbelievable and to go down there and rub elbows with the g like we sat with the not the levi stadium gm but levi strauss gm was in the same oh wow sat there and guessed with him during the game and wow he and my wife and uh luke and leanne pausable went to it and then we flew amy in and surprised luke and leanne with Amy. right i remember seeing that that's so cool man yeah it was a it was pretty surreal so I got my Joe Montana jersey and my hat, and I'm percent <laughs> for that now. Hell yeah! Well, that well, that was your first time in an NFL game. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Hey, it's a, it's a yeah, new experience. It's yeah, I've been to a couple in Vegas, and it's like I've been to a ton of NHL games and and some other sporting events, but like the NFL, like they have like game day presentation and like keeping people engaged down like down pat. It's pretty cool. It's crazy too because you watch on TV. Like I was watching the game on Sunday, and when they're not. Uh, when they are, uh, when San Fran's got the ball, the crowd's going nonstop. Yeah. When the opponent yeah. team has the ball, it is dead quiet. So there's definitely big <laughs> yeah. crowd noise on, the, on TV. <laughs> you could hear a pin drop in there when the other team has possession. But yeah, it's crazy. It's uh, yeah, cool. It's unbelievable, and the just the production of an NFL game is mm-hmm. second to none. I'd love to get down and the dirt and see how some of the moving parts on that kind of stuff for like a golden Knights game. Some of them. Oh yeah. Very cool. Big games like that. Well, and even, and even like some of these, uh, some of the NHL teams have like taken production to like a whole nother level. And I think, well, that's a conversation we can have on another show, but I think it's just so cool how we can take that kind of stuff and apply it to maybe what we're doing with rodeo. For sure. I think it's like, I'm always kind of watching and trying to learn and yeah, it'll be pretty cool. There's some cool stuff coming down the pipe, I think. Right on, man. Well, thanks for joining me, Tanner, and we'll definitely be be catch up again here soon. Um, you can find us on social media at ProteoCanada.com and Proteo Canada official on Instagram and Proteo Canada on Facebook. So we're all over the place. Um, thanks again for listening to the Short Run Podcast, and we'll catch you on the next show.